All right, thanks everyone for joining me today. Uh, my name is Ellen McIsaac, and I'm going to talk about how to find your dream internship. Um, so in terms of the agenda for today's presentation, we're going to go through my background. Um, when I've done this other times, I've given the audience a chance to introduce yourselves. Um, but I think for this one, we'll just have you do that in the chat. Um, we're going to talk about finding your path, how to apply for internships, including some resume writing basics and how to prepare for an interview. We're going to discuss presence and personal branding. And then we're going to talk about the fact that failure is an option, what to do when things don't work out how you expected. And then I've left plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you could hold your questions to the end, we'll have a chance for you to ask them either out loud or through the chat box. Uh, so my background, again, my name is Ellen. I grew up on the other side of the country in Avon, Connecticut. I'm a first alum. I was part of FRC team 1124, the Uberbots. Um, and based on my experience in first, I decided to become an engineer. I did my bachelor's degree in material science and engineering at MIT. After I graduated from MIT, I took my first job working for Pratt & Whitney which is a jet engine company. And um, the job that I took at Pratt & Whitney was more mechanical engineering focused, which is part of what drove me to go back to school part-time to get a master's degree in mechanical engineering, which I did at the University of Connecticut. And then I had the opportunity to take a job with Lockheed Martin in Palmdale, California, which is what brought me out here to the West Coast. And while I was working for Lockheed Martin, I got my master's in management science and engineering from Stanford. Um, and outside of work, I do a lot of volunteer work with organizations like FIRST, uh, the Society of Women Engineers, um, the MIT Alumni Association, and I also volunteer with the Palmdale Aerospace Academy, which is a K through 12 STEM focused charter school here in Palmdale. And um, in terms of why me um, to give this presentation? I ran the intern program at Lockheed Martin from 2017 to 2019. So I've worked with actually a couple hundred different college interns and I've also helped with the high school intern program. So I've been on the side of the hiring manager, reviewing resumes and interviewing people. Um, and then just for fun, um, in the top right hand corner, those are my dogs, Pepper and Jax. And we've since added a third dog named Bree. So my dogs are named after cheese, um, which is just a fun fact. Um, so just to get you all in the mindset of why are you here? What do you wanna get out of this presentation? Um, if you are willing to share, you can type in the chat box to introduce yourself with your name, what grade you are, what's your favorite subject in school, and what's your dream job. And um, from my perspective, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do at the beginning of high school. Uh, I knew I liked math and science. I did not know what I could do with that other than maybe be a math teacher or a science teacher. Um, and by the time I finished high school, I had learned from my experience in FIRST that I wanted to use those math and science skills to solve problems, which is really what engineering is. So in terms of how to find your path, you know, you, you wanna get an internship, but in what? Um, so some of the steps that you can use to figure that out are first to think about what are you interested in? What classes do you like the most and why? What do you enjoy about the hobbies that you have outside of school? And what kind of work makes you happy? I think it's really important to think about your strengths, weaknesses, likes, and dislikes to help find a potential career path that would be a good fit for you. So going hand in hand with what you're interested in, you can also think about what are your strengths and your talents? What kinds of skills come most naturally to you? And what kinds of problems do you like solving? Um, you know, it's, it's important, um, but it seems silly to pick a career where you would struggle constantly because you're fighting an uphill battle. Uh, so it makes sense to try to leverage some of your natural talents and gifts. 
And then another thing to think about is to work smarter, not harder. Um, so just like what I was saying, you can always develop some of your weaknesses and make them so they're they're not something that's holding you back. Uh, but you know, for me personally, there's a lot of career paths. So, you know, maybe I could get paid a little bit more as a software engineer, uh, but I would hate my life. And so for me, that's not the path I chose in engineering. Um, instead, I do things that are more mechanically focused and more focused on materials, which are things that I really love and that I have some talents at. Um, so, you know, to make your career fun and rewarding, you want to use your strengths and find a niche that's a good fit for you. So now you've spent some time thinking about what do you enjoy? Uh, what are you good at? It might be a little bit too early in your career to apply to internships, uh, but a lot of times you can use volunteer work to pave that work experience path for, for later on. So this really applies to either one, internships or volunteer positions. So to me, the first step of that process is to research the opportunities, think about what kinds of work you want to do, think about what skills you want to use the opportunity to develop, and then research where that's offered. Um, so think about what industries that might be, um, you know, there's so many different types of um, industries where you can use different skill sets and there's overlap in some places. Um, I took my materials degree to the aerospace industry, but everything is made of materials. Um, so there's lots of other places that I could have gone with that. Um, you can use your network. Uh, so perhaps mentors from your first team or um, different organizations um, from school or from volunteer work, you can ask people about what opportunities they know about. Once you've researched opportunities and found places you're interested in, maybe it's a certain industry or a certain company you wanna work for, the next step is to apply to the jobs. So to apply to a job, you need a resume, you probably need a cover letter and it's helpful to have an elevator pitch. So a resume is usually a short, maybe one page document that talks about your qualifications, um, usually in bullet point format. The cover letter is a letter to the hiring manager that explains why you want to work at that job and elaborates on some of, maybe give some examples of some of the skills that you bring to the table. An elevator pitch is supposed to be a short verbal explanation that you could basically say on an elevator ride, something to pique people's interest and tell them, you know, who you are, why you're interested, why they should be interested in you. So this is another place where you could use your network. Um, people like me, other volunteers in FIRST Robotics, um, we can give you advice based on our experience to help edit your resume or practice your elevator pitch. Once you've applied to jobs, if you've gotten the opportunity to interview, then the next step is to prepare for your interview um, by thinking about potential questions that the interviewers might ask, preparing talking points that you wanna make sure you get across, and thinking about what questions you have for the company that you wanna ask during the interview. So we're gonna go through all of those steps in more detail. So depending on where you are in your career, um, you may have never written a resume. The first resume that I wrote was when I was applying to college because we had to attach one and I had no idea what I was doing. So you might find that you were in the same boat as high school me. So I wanna talk you through some of the steps of what goes in a resume and why. Something to keep in mind here is um, depending on what point you're at in your life and your education, your resume could look very different. So if you're still in high school, you probably don't have a lot of parts of this resume because you're not in college yet. Um, so you only have your high school experience to put on there. You might not have lots of club experience if you haven't been in school for very long. 
Um, so all of this stuff is adaptable. You do not have to fill up an entire page. Um, you don't have to make things up to sound more impressive. Um, you can use this as a living document and just update it as things change in your life. Um, so this is just one example of what a resume could look like. I'm gonna go through some of the sections and then I have a link to more examples of resumes on the next slide. So this is an example that I pulled from MIT's Career Center and it's an example of a freshman in college's resume. So every resume, wherever you are in your education should have a header section on top. That's your name and your contact information. So email address and phone number. Um, some people also put their location, um, entire address, or maybe just the city and state that you live in for reference. Um, depending on what you're applying to, that doesn't have to be there, but you need to tell them who you are and how to get in contact with you. And believe it or not, I have gotten sent resumes of people that either didn't have their name on the top or didn't have their contact information. So it's like you could be the best candidate in the world, but if I can't get in contact with you, that's not very helpful. Uh, the next set, oh, one more thing on the header. Um, so some people have like fun email addresses, but um, if you're applying to something serious, either applying to college or applying to jobs, you probably want to have a serious version of your email address, maybe something like a variation of your name. Um, you don't want to be, you know, drama queen 75, which was one of my high school friends. Um, I am addresses um, that sounds kind of silly to a professional company. But if you make a special email address to sound more professional, make sure you actually check it. Because um, I've also had people that, you know, we reached out to to schedule an interview and they never checked that email address. So they didn't notice for three months that we tried to contact them. And at that point, the job had already been filled. So the next thing is education. So if you're in high school, you can just put your high school education on there. Um, you wanna say what year you're going to graduate because that's part of what employers wanna know. Um, if you're looking for a high school job, they wanna know how long can they keep you for or if you're looking for a college internship, they also want to know when are you gonna graduate and that would maybe need to turn into a full-time job. Um, you can potentially put down your class rank or SAT scores, that's not necessarily required. Um, GPA is another thing that could be an option. Again, not necessarily required, it depends on what the job asks for. And uh, depending on what the job is requesting, you could put down relevant courses if it's asking for certain skills like programming or 3D printing or a certain level of math. If you're in college, um, you can also list your college experience um, and you always list it from most recent to oldest. So you start with your most recent education or your most recent career experience on the top. The next section is um, up to you. Everything below education, you can kind of flip flop depending on what's most relevant and important to you. Um, for this student and probably for me too at this point in my life, I would have put leadership experience or project experience next. So that's a place where you can highlight leadership experience and extracurriculars like FIRST Robotics, or you could put down personal engineering projects that you've done outside of school. Um, another section you can put in there is work experience. If you have any formal work experience, either through paid work or volunteer work. Um, again, all this stuff can be flip-flopped, but basically those sections are the meat of your resume that you're using to share any relevant experience you have, whether it's in school clubs, personal projects, paid work, or volunteer work. And then another optional section, depending on what you do outside of school, is activities, memberships, um, maybe awards. So most of you are probably connected to FIRST Robotics in some way. FIRST Robotics is a great activity to list on your resume. Um, it shows a lot of hands-on skills, it shows teamwork. Um, so depending on how much you have the list, you could list them like this, where you have 
like the header that says, hey, I was on first team number, blah, blah, blah. And then you can add some detail under it. Like if you held any leadership positions on your team or if you develop certain skills, um, or you could just leave it as a bullet point that you were a member of first team one, two, three, four. If you have any awards or honors that you've been recognized for, scholarships that you've earned, those should definitely be listed on your resume somewhere. And then another section that people like to use is the skills section. Um, so a lot of times employers are looking for if there's any specialized skills you bring to the table, which you almost certainly have some of as a first team member. Um, that could be programming languages that you know how to code in. It could be things like soldering. Um, it could be things like 3D printing. Uh, it could be tools that you've used for CAD, like SolidWorks. Anything like that would be considered a special skill that's worth mentioning, um, using machine tools, anything like that. So especially if a job is requesting those skills, you want to make sure that you mention you do have that skill. So again, I've already mentioned the sections of the resume are flexible. You can adapt them to your needs. As long as you have your header at the top that says who you are, how to reach you, and you've got to have your education in there somewhere if you're in school, the rest of the page is really all up to you based on what tells your story the best. Um, if you are in high school or in college, I recommend keeping your resume to one page long. Um, it is supposed to be a summary, something that's quick and easy to read to showcase the highlights. Um, it's almost like the teaser, and then in the interview, you go into more detail. I have gotten resumes from, from high school students that were four pages long or 10 pages long, where they told their entire life story. And I think they're trying to sound impressive, but actually it reads as they don't understand what a resume is for. Um, so definitely for most purposes in high school or college, one page is enough. Um, sometimes uh, there will be exceptions, for academic jobs, there's something called the CV, curriculum vitae, and that really does want your entire history. Um, so, you know, read the requirements, but one page is probably good enough for most purposes. If you have personal projects or other things that you really want to show in more detail, uh, a resume is probably not the right place to print out examples of all of your work but an online portfolio is a great place to do that. And you can put a link to your website in your header on your resume. And that's where you can show examples of artwork, CAD design, personal engineering projects you've designed, things from your robotics team. Um, so you, know, you can put that link in there and then that opens up the possibility for you to show a lot more if you have that. If you have questions about how to write a resume or what's the right way to show something in your case. Uh, there's lots of resources that you can leverage. Your high school guidance counselors should have experience doing that. Um, out here in the greater Los Angeles area, I've noticed that a lot of high schools have work experience coordinators. So if your school or your school district has a work experience coordinator, they should have experience with writing resumes, what to put on there. So they're a great person to ask. If you are in college, your college career center definitely has experience with writing resumes. And then um, if you're a member of a professional engineering organization or professional business organization, they are also good resources um, for resume help. So for me, I'm a member of the Society of Women Engineers and people from SWE helped me a lot when I was in college. Um, you can also leverage people from other organizations you're connected with. So like those of us who are FIRST alumni who volunteer with FIRST, we can probably help you with your resume too. So the last thing here for resume advice, this is a link to MIT's Career Center. And they have, it's like a 15 page book that shows different examples of resumes that their Career Center has worked on with their students. Um, and it shows at different career stages. So like a freshman in college, a sophomore, an upperclassman and a graduate student. So you can see how things might change as you get more experience. And there's nothing special about this MIT set. I just knew it existed because I used their career center when I was in school. Um, if you Google 
engineering resume example or business resume example, you'll find other university career centers that give a lot of the same advice. So you can feel free to use other resources too. All right, so you found your dream job, you wrote your resume, you applied online, you got the opportunity to do an interview. Now what? So at least for me, this is the process that I follow when I prepare for an interview. Um, my first step is always to brainstorm. What do I want the company to know about me? And then I try to put myself in the interviewer's shoes and think if I were the interviewer and I was interviewing someone for this job, what would I wanna ask them? And that kind of gets me thinking about, you know, what material do I wanna prepare? What do I wanna make sure I share about myself? So after thinking about those two steps, what do I wanna communicate about myself? And then what do I think the interviewer wants to know about me? I start to prepare information about myself. So you always wanna have the story of your background, you know, what is your educational experience or other relevant experience, perhaps through clubs like FIRST or hands-on projects. Uh, I think it's good to think about how you got interested in the role, because there's a good chance you will be asked that in any interview. You, you know, how did you hear about us? Why are you interested? Um, it's always good to think about what strengths that you would bring to the position that you're interviewing for. It's also good to think about what you want to get out of the opportunity. So those two things go hand in hand. You know, you, you want to have some strengths that you bring to the table that are the reason why the company would want to hire you. Um, but presumably you want to learn and grow from the experience too. That's part of what internships are about. Um, so that's also part of your story. You know, why are you drawn there? What do you want to get out of the job? What do you want to learn? And then really the, the thing that helps to set a lot of people apart is when they can give examples or stories that demonstrate relevant skills that they have. And um, for, for most jobs, there's usually going to be some emphasis on whatever relevant technical skills you have, but there's also gonna be an emphasis on, well, how do you work in teams? Um, teamwork, communication skills, because most jobs have you working with other people. So if you brainstorm some examples of how you demonstrate uh, specific technical skills, leadership skills, communication, or teamwork, you'll probably find opportunities to share those in the interview and that will really strengthen your impact on the interviewer. The last thing to think about is what questions you have for the interviewer. So what do you wanna learn about the company or the specific position? I'm sure you have some questions going into it and your interview will always give you the chance to ask questions. Uh, so you probably wanna have a couple of questions prepared. Another thing to think about is presence and personal branding. Um, you wanna know your audience. Um, you know, what is the company that you're interviewing for? Do you know anything about their culture? Um, is the person who's interviewing you the manager that you would be working for? Or are they a teammate that you'd be working with? Are they from human resources? Um, so we just talked about the power of stories and examples to illustrate this. I'm going to share a story from my experience. Um, so I work in the aerospace industry. Um, in the aerospace industry, at least what I've seen with interviews is there's a lot of emphasis on your personal contributions. You know, show us your skills. What did you do? And if you talk about the team in generic sense, and you don't really share what you did and how you contributed to that team, um, your examples aren't necessarily very impactful. So when I interviewed for my job running the intern program at Lockheed Martin, one example that I shared was a story about how I changed the culture in my college SWE section. And um, when I was in college and I was a member of the Society of Women Engineers, there was kind of this elitist attitude that a lot of the other SWE members had. It was kind of like, you know, we're MIT, we're so great. Why should we collaborate with anyone else? We probably have the best events. Um, and I, I got involved in 
SWE at a national level and met people from other colleges all around the country. And I heard about some really cool stuff that other people were doing. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that, yes, we did have a lot of great stuff at MIT, but there was a lot of great stuff that other people were doing too. And we could really benefit from collaborating with other groups. And so I really worked over a period of time to change that culture and make people more open-minded and tone down the elitism and want to work together. And so I told the story about what I did to change the culture and uh, the impact that it made over time and the, the steps that I had personally taken to change the culture and the end result. And I got feedback after my interview at Lockheed that that example was one of the things that really sealed the deal and got me the job. They liked the effort that I had put into creating a more positive and collaborative culture and that it was a meaningful change that I helped to orchestrate over time. So I was like, great, you know, this is a good interview example. I'm going to use this again for other interviews in the future. So within the next year or so, um, I interviewed for a position on the Society of Women Engineers Board of Directors. And I brought the same example with me because I was like, you know, this is a sweet example. They loved it at Lockheed. This is going to be great. And I used all of my aerospace industry interviewing tricks where I focused on I, 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 what did I do? Um, and it turns out that doesn't really go over well in an organization like SWE, which is, you know, it's a volunteer organization. It's something people do outside of work in their free time. And it's a lot about just uplifting and helping other women. So when I told this the same story with this emphasis on I, 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 me, 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 here's all the stuff I did, um, they basically ripped me to shreds <laughs> because they saw this as, you know, that's really self-centered and yes, you were trying to change the culture, but, you know, you, you were putting everyone else down and you made it sound like you were the savior and they just really did not like the way that that same example read. And so that's a good example of know your audience. Two very different cultures looking for two very different things. I think I could have used that same example successfully with SWE if I had focused more on the teamwork aspect and less about my personal contributions. Um, but trying to translate that very rigid aerospace culture into an organization that's all about um, flexibility and um, volunteering outside of work and helping each other. It just didn't really work. So another thing to think about when it comes to presence and personal branding is choosing your words carefully. And that, that in some ways ties to knowing your audience, right? Like if I had taken that same example and tailored it differently, um, changed the way that I framed it and shared it, maybe it could have worked. Um, in general, during the interview process, it's a good idea to take a pause after the interviewer asks you a question. Just take a couple of seconds to think about your response before you jump into it. And that gives you time to choose your words more carefully. Um, I know for a lot of us, if you jump into something, you can end up tripping over your words or maybe something doesn't come out quite the way you intended it. Um, so what I've heard is an interview best practice and I've tried to do myself is just Anytime the interviewer asks you a question, take a couple of seconds to gather your thoughts before you answer. And that also helps because if there is something you get stuck on, um, it's less obvious that you're stuck if you've taken a short break before answering all of the questions. Um, another step to keep in mind is dress to impress. Um, try to dress your best to reflect what's expected in whatever industry that you are interviewing for. Um, so that's another thing where know your audience matters. Different industries do have different expectations about how to dress. Um, the tech industry is notorious for being very casual. So if you show up to an interview with Facebook or Google in a full suit, you will probably look out of place. Uh, but likewise, if you show up to aerospace industry like me, um, you know, if you came to Lockheed dressed in jeans and a t-shirt for your interview, you're a little bit too casual. So do a little bit of research on where you're applying and um, try to adjust how you present yourself based on that. Um, in general, going on the more conservative side is better. Um, so 
Um, usually, um, you know, a long sleeve button down is something that's hard to go wrong with that reads well most places. Um, even when it comes to like women's footwear, um, you want to choose something that you're comfortable in that you won't be fidgeting with and adjusting with. Uh, so like in a lot of more old fashioned places, high heels read as being more formal, but if you're wearing high heels and tripping in them, that looks worse than wearing flat shoes and being able to walk confidently and carry yourself confidently. And I think a lot of those old fashioned rules are starting to go away. Um, things are getting more casual over time. So definitely focus on comfort. Um, likewise, I said a button down shirt is something that's hard to go wrong with, but you know, if you have issues with buttons gaping or if you're just very uncomfortable wearing button downs and you're gonna be fidgeting with it, adjusting sleeves, that's a bad choice. And maybe, you know, a simple sweater or a blouse that doesn't have buttons or something like that is a better choice. So choose what you're comfortable with and whatever is appropriate for the company culture for where you're interviewing. And then the last thing to think about with presence and personal branding is to present your authentic self. Um, I think sometimes people get in their mind that maybe there's this ideal image of what the company is looking for. And then they try to replicate whatever they think the ideal traits are that the company is looking for. Um, but really be yourself. I know when I've interviewed people for positions, part of what I'm looking for is to get to know them, what makes them tick, what are their interests, and um, what are their strengths. And that's what I would use to match them with positions. So when I had people, you know, I'd ask them what they're interested in, and they'd be like, oh, I'll do anything. I'd just be happy to have any job here that's not really helpful for, for me as a hiring manager because I don't really get any insight into who you are, um, what excites you. And so I really have no idea what job to match you with. So I definitely think it's more important to just be honest about what you like, what you dislike, what you're looking for, because um, it'll really help the company to figure out where you fit. And there's lots of companies where, you know, they might interview you for a job and they might really like you Maybe they find that you're not the right fit for this job, but they'll let you know when another opportunity comes up. Hey, I remember you from this interview. Would you be interested in applying to this role? I think it would be a good fit for you. So in the end, I think it's a lot more important to be honest and present your authentic self and not try to hide things or try to be something you're not. Um, it, it really works better to just be open and honest and it could open up new doors for you. So the last topic that I wanted to talk about is the fact that failure is an option. Um, you might not hear people talk about failing a lot, but every successful person has lots and lots of failures behind them. Um, you know, you can look at my background. I went to some good schools, but there's also schools I applied to that I didn't get into. I have a good job now, but there's lots of internships I applied to in college that I did not get. There's lots of full-time jobs that I applied to that I did not get. Uh, I've done some cool things volunteering outside of work, um, but some of those opportunities took more than one try to. Um, I was on the SWE board of directors once before that really disastrous interview. Um, and that took two, two applications to get that job. Uh, I've gotten some awards for things that I applied more than one time before I got the award. This is very common. Um, but sometimes if you're just looking at someone's resume or their LinkedIn page or their social media, people mostly talk about the successes, right? So it's easy to look at people's list of successes and think, you know, they're so much better than you and you're never going to succeed. Or maybe that's just the spiral I get myself into sometimes. Um, something that I wish that people had taught me about earlier in life is this idea of a growth mindset. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the concept of a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset, but basically what that is, is a fixed mindset is the belief that you are essentially static, like you're born with a certain set of skills or natural talents, and, and that's just it, right? Either you're good at math or you're not, either you're good at writing or you're not. And a growth mindset is the opposite of that. It's the idea that if you apply yourself, you can learn from things that don't go so well and you can 
take those lessons learned and help to develop yourself and grow over time. And I really wish someone had taught me about that earlier in life because um, the idea of a growth mindset can be so helpful in developing yourself and developing your skills over time. You know, things are not going to go well every single time. You will not get every job you apply for. Um, you will not get every award you apply for. That's life. And you can take those things and say, well, you know, that's it. I'm a failure and just throw all those opportunities away and never try again. Or you can learn from those things. So if you ask for feedback, you know, if, if you don't get the job, ask the company, ask the interviewer if they can provide you with any feedback. You can use that feedback to learn from it and learn how to do things better and develop your interview skills for the next time. Um, even in your clubs and extracurricular activities, you know, you can ask your teammates, you can ask your mentors for feedback on what they see as your strengths and your opportunities for growth. I would take any opportunities you can um, inside the workplace and outside to ask for feedback so you can learn from other people's perspectives on what you're doing well and where there's opportunities for you to improve. For me, getting feedback, even though it has sometimes been painful, has been a big part of helping me to develop myself and find opportunities to grow and eventually succeed. Now you can take those feedback, the, the feedback that you get from people, and you can use that to set and develop goals for yourself. Um, so depending on the feedback you get, you could have goals to practice certain skills, um, to, to maybe reach out to mentors or coaches to help yourself develop certain skills. Um, maybe it's just something like, I will apply for this job opportunity again um, within a year. And you're going to work on your, your resume and work on your interview skills and you're going to try again within a certain period of time. Um, it helps if you make goals that are, there's an acronym called SMART goals. So goals that are specific, goals that are measurable, goals that are actionable, um, goals that are realistic, and goals that are timely. So if I said, you know, I wanna be the CEO of Lockheed Martin within two years, that's not realistic. I don't have enough experience. But if I said my career goal is to retire as a CEO, um, you know, that gives me a longer period of time that's realistic, um, that's more timely. Um, and then maybe I could set up a stage of interim goals along the way of, you know, what does it take if I wanna finish my career as a CEO? I could come up with shorter plans with steps that would be more actionable, that would be measurable, that could help me progress towards that. So I think it's really important to learn from failure. Um, don't just take it as, well, you know, I didn't get the job, I didn't get into the school I wanted, I'm a failure. You can have a growth mindset, you can develop yourself over time, you are a work in progress, you can take something away from any situation that doesn't work out the way you want it to. So if you adapt that flexible, positive growth mindset, you can do a lot with that to develop yourself. And then the last thing is just build resilience. It definitely stings sometimes when you don't get what you want, when you get rejected from the job, when you don't get into the school you want, when you don't win the award, um, you don't get into the club, whatever it is. Um, and it's okay to, you know, feel bad about that for a little while, um, but eventually you have to move on, build some resilience, accept the fact that we can't all be successful 100% of the time, and start that cycle of asking for feedback, using that to set goals, and learning from that failure to bring it forward with you. So with that, I want to open it up for any questions. I'm happy to talk about anything related to college, careers, applying for jobs. Um, and then I also wanted to share my email address if you have questions after the fact. Um, and if you are on the LAFTC Discord, I can answer questions there after the fact as well. Hi. So I had, I'm not in high school anymore, but maybe this might be a good question. Um, 
how do you for for the current high school is here how do you guys how do you think is the best way because of the COVID-19 crisis to get an internship That's a good question. Um, COVID-19 has definitely changed the landscape for how typical job and internship applications are going. So I know for some companies, um, because of restrictions on how many people can be there at once or because of changes in funding, um, it may have reduced or eliminated opportunities for internships. Uh, but in other places, it has opened up new opportunities where companies are doing virtual internships or shorter term internships or things that are more flexible. Uh, so in general, most things tend to be posted online these days. I would check out company websites. Um, a lot of them have pages. Um, there's a lot more high school internship programs now than there used to be. So a lot of them even have special high school internship pages on their websites. Um, and definitely a lot of companies are focused on college internships. Um, so they should have college internship pages on their recruiting sites and, you know, they'll talk more about some of the specifics, but I would use your network too. So people that, you know, through first or people who, you know, through professional organizations and ask them what they know about. I think, um, leveraging your network and, you know, just finding out what's out there through the people that, you know, um, it can make a big difference just to open your eyes to new opportunities. And I know companies are trying to be creative and trying to be flexible about the way that they bring new people on board. Um, so it, it's a tough time right now in a sense because things are changing a lot and companies don't really know exactly what to do, but I'm seeing some, some new hope and new opportunities come out of this crisis. Um, things like virtual internships open up the possibility for you to do an internship while you're in college that's maybe on the opposite side of the country or even in another country. Um, and I've seen more opportunities for short-term project work where maybe it's not a three month or six month internship or co-op, um, but it's a specific project that's broken more into a bite-sized piece. Um, so I would check company websites, company recruiting pages, and just talk to all the people you know in the industry that you're interested in. Awesome, thank you. I have another question here. So what was your biggest mistake? It's hard to pick one. Um, it's a pretty hard <laughs> context, but you know, that's part of the point, right? We've all done things that we wish we could learn from. Um, so I think uh, in the context of applying to internships specifically, I had no idea what I was doing in college when it came to writing a resume, preparing for interviews or applying to internships. I wish I had asked for help earlier. I wish I had used the resources at my career center or um, resources through people I knew through groups like First Robotics and Society of Women Engineers. But I was really stubborn and I wanted to be like, hey, I did this on my own, I didn't get help. I don't know why I was so fixated on that, uh, but I did a lot of just like really stupid things that were wasting my time when I tried to apply for internships with no help or, or guidance. So um, I, my freshman year of college, looked up like the addresses of local engineering companies and just mailed them letters being like, please hire me. Like, here's why I'm great and hireable. Um, and nobody hires people that way anymore. I think even if they had liked me, they couldn't have hired me that way. Um, most companies require you to apply through their online databases, especially big companies. Uh, so that was just a complete waste of my time. And if I had asked anybody who had any experience, they could have told me that. So I think um, I was too stubborn about, you know, making it on my own and doing things my own way. And I really got no benefit from that. And I, I should have asked for an accepted help earlier than I did. Um, Ellen, um, what about like networking and stuff? How important is that? So <laughs> the word networking always makes me think of my dad who starting from when I was in high school would tell me, you know, it's, it's important to network, build your network, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so, you know, you, especially as a teenager, don't necessarily want to listen to your parents' advice. And that seemed like such an abstract concept to me. And I didn't really know what to do. Like I had this vision in my mind of like stuffy 
networking events where you go meet random strangers at like cocktail tables. And I'm an introvert and that just sounds terrible to me. So that's another thing where I was like, no, networking is dumb. I don't want to do that. Um, but I think the vision that I had of networking in my mind was overly uh, restrictive. So for me, what building my network has, has meant is I do a lot of volunteer work. I made a lot of connections from people through um, volunteering for groups like First Robotics. And I don't think networking has to mean meeting strangers at like random events. I think um, networking can be a lot more informal than that and it can occur through real organic means of connection. So by being in organizations together um, like FIRST or by being in professional groups together like SWE or um, ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers is an organization that I'm involved with. Those things that you're doing just because you want to, those are ways to build your network. And connecting with other people um, through organic means like that, I think is actually very important to developing your career. Um, I, I, I had that vision early on that I'm gonna do everything by myself with no help, um, but real life doesn't really work that way. You know, people want to help you develop yourself and Nobody knows everything. That was very arrogant of me as an 18 year old to think that I could just magically figure it all out on my own. Um, it's, it's through my network that I found job opportunities that I've gotten access to mentoring by people who are further along in their careers. Um, and a lot of that has been really invaluable to me in developing my technical skills and developing communication skills, the way I present myself, um, finding opportunities. I, I got connected with someone at work who um, one of my mentors had recommended that I meet. And I, I only met with him one time, um, but he heard all my passion about um, mentoring and developing people and STEM outreach, all these things I do outside of work. And he turned out to be the person who posted the job opportunity to hire an intern manager at Lockheed Martin. So even from that one time that he met me, he remembered me, he remembered that a lot of that stuff is my passion. And so he told me about that job when he posted it and said, this sounds like something you'd really like, Ellen, I'd like you to think about applying. So I probably would have never heard about that job and never had the opportunity to run the intern program at Lockheed if I hadn't gotten, gotten connected with him through a mentor at work. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it is really important to build your network, uh, but there's lots of ways you can do that. And it doesn't have to be this stuffy, super formal thing with strangers, which was the vision I had in my head from my dad. So um, this might be a for a college question. And I know there's like, one or two other two other college students in here. So um, I personally, I'm uh, working on um, engine development for, for some rockets. Um, and with our group, it's rather difficult now to get to start looking at full-time jobs. So what would you recommend from the college to full-time job like transition? So a lot of the advice about resume writing and interviewing still applies. I would definitely prepare examples that show um, any kind of hands-on skills you have that you would bring to a company. I think having real world experience outside of just your classes is really helpful. Uh, so things that you do in engineering clubs, uh, things that you've done through school projects, any stuff that you do just yourself um, that really sets you apart as an engineer compared to someone who has just taken classes and never actually applied their engineering skills. So I would aim to share some of those projects on your resume or in your cover letter, um, prepare examples of that stuff to share in your interviews. Um, in terms of the aerospace industry specifically, um, I think the current state of aerospace COVID has taken a really big hit on the commercial side of the industry, but not so much on the defense side. So I would look at the companies that have a lot of defense projects and get a lot of government funding for their work because they are still hiring. 
Um, so like Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, um, Raytheon Technologies, um, Aerojet Rocketdyne, you know, those are the places that really are still hiring at a pretty impressive rate um, compared to the commercial side of the industry. And then I would, I would use any connections that you have to people who work there. So if you know people through FIRST, um, like me, um, or if you know people through professional organizations you're involved in, I would ask them for their advice on how to get into their company. And I would ask them if they know about openings. Um, I would say in general, the big companies tend to do a lot of their hiring between September and maybe February for um, college grads in the summer. So now is the time of year to be looking at positions um, for, for full-time if you're gonna be graduating in May or June of next year. Pretty much everyone makes you apply online. So apply online, um, but really look carefully at what the company says the requirements are for the positions and make sure you give very clear examples that show how you, you meet those requirements. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, I have another question for back to the high school stuff. So in as maybe in high school, a high school student, you probably won't have that many things to write about on your resume. So like as a recruiter or like even a college app, like reviewer, what would you, what do you look for? So for me personally, I am looking for something that shows that, um, so I've mostly done engineering hiring just for context. Um, so I'm looking for things that show that people want to be engineers. Um, so I do interviewing for people who are applying to MIT, for example. And I guess that one is more broad than just engineering. Um, but you know, I ask people about their hobbies in high school. Um, I ask people about what they're interested in studying in college. And if those things line up, then that kind of reinforces the idea that it is a real interest area for them. Um, but one time I interviewed someone who, he said his passions were math and science. And then I asked him about his hobbies and he didn't really have any, he didn't do anything outside of school. And it just didn't really make sense to me. You know, like there's so many different ways that could have showed that he really did enjoy math and science, but he didn't do anything with it. Um, he went to school and came home and did his homework. And then I don't know what, like, I, I don't know what the rest of his free time went to. Um, so in, in high school, I guess I'm curious what people are doing outside the classroom, whether it's clubs that they're involved in or personal projects or volunteer and service work. It doesn't really matter that much what it is, um, but it's just something that shows that you know, people are really enjoying and invested in whatever it is they want to do. And it's kind of the same thing in college. Like it could be internships, it could be college research, it could be clubs that you're involved in, um, like Formula SAE. Um, it, it could be just personal projects. But, you know, if you go to four years of college and somehow never manage to do anything to apply engineering, I'm kind of skeptical that you would really enjoy being an engineer um, in the professional world. So I think um, it could be a lot of things, but just having examples that show your passion, um, whatever form that's in, is really what I look for as an interviewer or a scholarship reviewer. Uh, I had another question about uh, resumes. Sure. Um, so, let's say you're like applying to a position where you know they're looking for um, specific skills like an engineering intern. Would it be better to like remove more general um, topics from your resume to write more about your engineering experience? Like let's say you would take off your like sports experience or like sports accomplishments to write more about your engineering experience. Oh, that's a really great question. I should have talked more about tailoring your resume earlier. Um, so in general, the answer to that question is yes. Um, it's a best practice. You know, you can keep a, a longer, more detailed version of your resume if you want to keep track of everything. But then 
tailor it down to focus on the specific things that are most relevant to the, the opportunity that you're applying for. Um, so if in your example, if you're applying to an engineering position, um, you would focus on highlighting more of your engineering skills. And that doesn't mean that you would have to take off the sports stuff entirely, but maybe you condense it to one line that talks about your sports instead of a whole section that talks about your sports achievements or vice versa. Um, you know, if you're applying to a position that is more focused on something non-technical, you might want to highlight more examples of leadership, teamwork, um, communication, and put less technical details about the fact that you know how to program a CNC machine, because um, that's not as relevant to what they're looking for. So you don't necessarily have to hide parts of yourself. You know, you wouldn't have to take off sports stuff entirely for an engineering position, but just add more details in the areas that are more relevant. Um, likewise, the further you get in your career, you know, the more experience you have, you probably want to focus on more recent things, um, especially if those are more relevant. So at this point, I am eight years and change out of college. Um, you know, my, my uh, college research project from 2009 isn't really that relevant anymore to employers because those skills are so old. Um, I, I don't remember how to do that stuff anymore. Okay, thank you. That was really helpful. All right, if there's no more questions, I think this is about time. Uh, thank you, Ellen, so much for coming. Um, it's really nice that you took the time out of your day, your busy schedule to talk, and I think a lot of people appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I hope this was helpful for everyone. And if you think of any questions after the fact, feel free to reach out to me uh, either by my email address, which I shared, or on the LAFTC Discord. Um, or if you're connected with Amanda, you can send her questions and she'll send them my way. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, the video will be up on YouTube probably within two hours. So you can review anything or you can see it. And then, um, the, if there's questions, the answers will be on in our Google sharing uh, folder. So I post them and then you can read them later. And the presentation is also there if you want to look back at any of the things we talked about. All right. I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.